So I'm going to try to put my comments in the context of the impact of globalization on working families and trade unions in our country, and then how we export that. And I thought I'd first start off by explaining to you what I mean, uh, the difference whenever I use the term globalization and when I use the word free trade. Because there's a lot of people who want us to confuse those two. And there's a major difference between the two. So I'll give you my explanation so that you at least know what I'm saying when I use the word free trade or when I use the word globalization. Now, I assume that you have two countries, and let's just take England and we'll take Spain. And England makes textiles and Spain makes wine, because we all know that England can't make wine. So, they both have a comparative advantage and they trade with one another. Flows back and forth, England gets wine from Spain, Spain gets textiles from England, both of them do better off and both of the economic pies of those two countries grow. That's free trade, where the comparative advantage allows products to flow back and forth, both people benefit from it. Globalization, on the other hand, is a little different. Now let's assume some enterprising young person in England says, you know, if I shut this factory down in England and I move it to Spain, I can supply the Spanish market and I can probably get it for a little bit cheaper labor. I can get those Spanish people who work for just a little less money and I can do better off. So the factory gets moved to Spain and Spain starts to buy some of its textiles from, uh, from itself and a little bit from England and England still continues to buy wine from Spain. Well Spain's economic pie will increase. But the economic pie of England will begin to shrink. That's the difference between free trade and globalization. It's the difference between products moving back and forth across borders and the productive capacity to make those products. We've been the victim of globalization in this country. That's what we've been the victim of. And we were told that we were going to build the, the strongest economy and the most vibrant economy in the world. And quite frankly, there's truth to that. We did. At least we had. But I have to tell you right now that economy is in a mess. And many of the White House and elite economists continue to be in denial. But there's, there's simply no question that right now we're in a full-blown recession. But this recession is really the predictable result of three decades of conservative, neoliberal, profit-skimming corporate policies like globalization, like deregulation, like privatization, and like deunionization among them. Now, the recession is really a matter of degree for working families because workers in this country have been in a permanent recession for 30 years now. Wages, our wages have been stagnant since 1973. In fact, just since 2000, median wages in this country have dropped by $1,273 just since the year 2000. We maintain our middle class status only by first working longer hours and then by taking on a second job and then by sending more of our family members into the workforce, and then by taking on more and more and more debt. And throughout this process, the economy kept going down. Now, we've engaged in the wrong priorities, and bad neoliberal economic policies have been hurting us for a number of years. And let me go back for just a second. Because it wasn't always this way in, the, in our country. From 1946 until 1973, incomes in the United States doubled. Absolutely doubled. It was the greatest expansion of wealth in any country during any period of time. And the most interesting thing was that the people at the bottom end of the spectrum had their income increasing faster than the people at the top end of the spectrum. 
So the wage gap was collapsing, and the middle class was being born. It was during that same period of time that productivity in the United States doubled, and so did our wages. So we were wedded. As productivity went up, we shared in all of that. We did that because there was an agreement, a negotiated sort of social contract between our employers and, and, and unions that was negotiated because of relatively equal strength between us. So as productivity went up, wages went up. Since then, however, we've seen that relationship rupture. You can't see this graph section very well, but these light colored lines, if you will, they're, they're in your packet, were the period from 47 to 73. But since 73, it's been a completely different game. First of all, income has increased far, far slower. And the people at the bottom end of the spectrum have done far worse. The poorest 20% have had their income since 73 increased by 5%. The next quartile increased by 20 or 14%. The next one, 24%. And the people at the bottom, the richest 20%, well, their income went up 69%. But listen to this. The people in the top one-tenth of a percent, one-tenth, that's people who make more than $6.5 million a year. Their income increased 468%. And the people in the top 100th of percent, that's the people who make more than 30 million a year, well, their income rose 684%. So all the income after 73 was going to the people at the very top uh, of the spectrum. So essentially what was happening was we make it, and they take it. We work longer hours than in any other developed country. We live in a nation that is the richest. We produce over $13 trillion a year in income. I got to ask, we're the richest nation on the face of the earth at our most, most rich point in time. And this is the question I ask. Why is it so difficult for so many Americans to make a living? in the richest nation on the face of the earth at its most rich point in time. See, that's what they did. Little by little, they built this box around us, piece by piece. They didn't come in all at once and say, we're going to give you stagnant wages. We're going to make 47 million of you uh, have no health care, and then one out of five, another one out of three, rather, have under health care. They built it block by block. And quite frankly, I wish I could just tell you that all you had to do is throw Republicans out and bring Democrats in. But that's not true. Because if you look at the Treasury Secre Secretary under Bill Clinton was Bob Rubin. He was the former CEO of Goldman Sachs. The current Treasury Secretary for Bush is Henry Paulson, former CEO of Goldman and Sachs. They worked together for 19 years in the adjoining offices. Now that would be like saying, one president's going to get me and the other one's going to get Fred Redmond and you people believe that you're going to get something different. You are. But see, it's up to us to make sure that we hold whoever we get elected accountable from now on. And we don't let Wall Street hijack the economy like they have for the last 20 some years. Because I could make a damn strong case that what we're living with right now was half hatched by Bob Rubin and company as well as Henry Paulson and company. So what we're trying to do is go back upstream. Attack things. Make them look at failed trade policies that have not only hurt us, but have hurt our trading partners. Make them look at the Columbia Free Trade Agreement and say, if a country can't secure 
the, the protection and the livelihood and the health and the safety of its citizens. How do you expect us to believe that they'll ever be able to enforce a trade agreement anyway? If they allow 2,500 trade unionists to be murdered and do nothing about it, how could we ever create and sign a deal with them? How could we do that? 